The fishing industry's contribution to Kenya's annual wealth is about 0.8%, but this is absolutely low, bearing in mind that the industry has the potential to contribute an upward of about 5%. And the question is, what is the country doing to exploit this potential? And how has the industry been impacted by the raging floods as well as the global COVID-19 pandemic? Joining us on Inside Government is the Principal Secretary in charge of Fisheries, Aquaculture and Blue Economy, Professor Japet Intilo. Thank you so very much indeed for your time. Thank you. For joining us here. Thank you. Uh, I mean, one may not understand the correlation between coronavirus and the fishing industry. Please <laughs> help us understand. Mm. You see, the fishing industry is about people uh, doing the things that are related to fisheries and its development, the activities of uh, going for fish from the natural waters, bringing fish, uh, processing fish, taking it to the market, mm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Farming fish, the fish farmers, and things that... So it is a people's thing. It's and therefore... And interaction of people. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's development and the people. And therefore, when uh, a disease like uh, COVID and any other disease affects people, then it has an impact on the activities that our people do. And uh, this is what, what we have seen recently in the sense that, uh, you see, COVID did not just affect the, the, the fishing industry per se. It affected the entire uh, spectrum of human activities in an economy. And so uh, the other sectors, since every sector is related, in one way or the other, to everything else. Mm -hmm. So fisheries also becomes part of that which is affected in the entire mix of this pandemic. It is part of the value chain. Yeah, but I think um, uh, the most interesting thing we saw was the relationship between fisheries and tourism, particularly at the Kenya coast. Mm -hmm. And also probably with the local uh, tourist activities around lakes and things like that, mm. uh, that are the two sectors in the data that we are reviewing now are very closely correlated in the sense that tourism is a people's activity, fisheries is a people's activity that deals with boats in particular, deals with taking visitors and tourists from one point to the other, bringing fish that will be taken to markets and to the hotels uh, that are tourists on Findon. And therefore, the closure of the tourism industry has affected uh, very seriously the, 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 fishing, the fishing industry because one, markets uh, are distorted and uh, you know, this causes a lot of confusion. Everything stops. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and you have rightly put it, uh, you know, the tourism sector has almost come to a standstill, and which means that um, a lot of conference centers, uh, most meetings, you know, have been cancelled. Most hotels have closed shop. And when you go to almost every hotel, you find that fish is part of the delicacy in, in, in all these. And, and, and so you expect a major heat on this industry, how bad is the situation likely to be? Well, it's, uh, it's bad in the sense that uh, fishers lose the market, fishers lose their daily livelihood, and this then goes back to the families uh, where they used to get um, money for various other activities mm -hmm. in life, uh, for, for, for uh, money for, for servicing their life per se, and the interconnectivities in the entire in the entire fishing industry. I think it also affects uh, things like uh, those vessels that use fuel, will not take any more fuel. Uh, many of the boats with several people, the several people lose a livelihood, 
I think this is the impact. And when you look, you know, at the industry, you know, it supports between 1.2 to 1.5 million people. 1.2 1, 1, 1 to 1.5 million jobs, you know, locally here. And so the fact that, you know, some, 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 some fish producing counties like Mombasa, Kuala and Kilifi, mm. you know, they are on a lockdown. And so how would these actually affect the jobs down there? I think a lockdown. And uh, you see, the whole process of dealing with COVID, I think in many, in my own uh, observation, is like, you know, many people did not understand uh, what was uh, the mechanisms and the protocols that were being put in place. And, you know, the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, COVID, the virus, is not something that you can see uh, walking around so you can physically prepare yourself. I think it, was, it required a mental shift to understand what it is mm -hmm. and uh, what mechanisms and processes we need to take to protect ourselves and to protect the other person and to avoid the spreading of the disease. So the protocols that were given, many people did not understand them. Say, so for example, the use of masks. It is like... Uh, uh, you know, the reaction was that uh, this thing is a punishment or something like that, which was not the case. The mask is a scientific tool to protect yourself from being infected by others and also you yourself to affect the other, the other person. And um, things like uh, staying at home, uh, uh, minimizing movements and things like that. All these were meant to protect our people, mm. to protect fishers, fishers who do the fishing, you see, you see what I mean? We need a healthy population to be able to do that. So lockdowns then will be managed in ways that then make sure that people don't suffer. And I think that is happening. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, we get out of this so that the people can go back to normal lives mm -hmm. and do the kind of things we do. Those who farm can farm, those who fish can fish, those who transport products can transport them, because that is what builds an economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, when you look at you know, uh, uh, you know, the fishing industry here in Kenya, I mean, most of it is artisanal fishing. Uh, and uh, poverty among you know, the fishing communities or, 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 or or the communities that are en that are engaged uh, in the business of fishing, you know, when you look at Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, uh, they will tell you that it's between uh, 48 to 65 percent, uh, saying meaning that uh, they are likely to feel as they are likely to feel so much heat, you know, from the ongoing cessation of movement, you know, from fish producing counties. And of course, shelter in, in place orders, you know, that have been issued. And of course, the closure of restaurants and hotels. Uh, are we likely to see this community, you know, sli sliding deeper into poverty levels? And if yes, what are the mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, we get them to where they were before? And of course, to, to a higher ground. Of course, this is not uh, a Kenyan thing. I think uh, fisheries all over the world has been affected. Uh, it's, it's not just a Kenyan thing. It's global. And usually when uh, there is such a global lockdown, economies and the people suffer. And uh, I think uh, governments and the people themselves then plan how to survive during that period so that when this period is over, then we can get back and uh, put in mechanisms. Like you've heard, uh, governments are planning stimulus packages so that uh, those economies can be resuscitated again moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you saw like yesterday, we were signing a, a, a county participation agreement with the five uh, coastal counties in Kenya on uh, on a marine fisheries program which will go on for five years targeting the 
five counties. I think the program has come at the right time. Uh, of course, uh, of course, this was part of our planning, but it has coincided mm -hmm. with this. And I think this is good for the coastal communities moving forward, particularly the fishers, because we should be able to pick from there and move on and uh, make uh, fisheries better. Mm -hmm. The program uh, uh, deals with issues to do with uh, uh, fisheries and governance. You talked about the coast. Uh, the problem has been that uh, we haven't invested substantially in the fisheries sector at the coast to move into the deeper uh, parts of uh, the, the, the ocean waters. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge has been that uh, you need uh, proper boats to get into the deeper waters. Mm -hmm. You need to have trained people to be able to manage those crafts and things like that. But historically, this has not happened. And I think this is what we want to address this time. Mm -hmm. So what you see is that the shallow waters are basically overfished. And when you have an overfished fishery, when you have a lot of fishing capacity, then it is dangerous for that fishery because then it doesn't help people. Uh, it is stressed. Uh, we are in competition, doesn't give us enough food. So I think we need to plan to get to the deeper waters. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we are going to do is to get some of these fishermen to diversify their economic base, move into other activities, activities that uh, would allow the shallow waters to recover while they move into businesses that they would like move into uh, agriculture activities that would quickly generate money and things like that. Mm -hmm. So this is what we are trying mm -hmm. to do. And of course this would be expected to be, you know, a, a long time approach because I mean this community, some of these communities they have in their entire life, I mean, they have only known one business and that is going into the waters and doing the fishing. So when you try to help them or to advise them to diversify, I mean, you expect to see naturally, you know, some resistance. And of course, by the time you pick up, uh, it's expected to be a bit of time. I, I, think, I, th I think, Brian, my experience in uh, working with fishers for quite some time, uh, I, I think it's not true that uh, they're just mono, mono, you know, economically oriented to to fishing, they do other things. I saw, for example, in Lake Victoria that uh, fishermen also, also farm at the Kenya coast. Uh, I was told the other day that most of the communities out there are farming communities, you see what I mean? And I think if we diversify their economic base, this is one way of getting people out of Poverty, particularly poverty, really tend to a one approach to an economic thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can take you back to 2008, you know, during um, the global financial pandemic, and Kenya came up, you know, with a stimulus uh, a program, you know, in a bid to boost economic growth and business activities. And one of the areas that was highlighted and came out very strongly was encouraging aquaculture business, which yeah thrived back then. Um, today is a different case altogether because of various factors like lack of markets and so much. Uh, and when President Uhuru Kenyatta, you know, released his eight-point uh, stimulus package, uh, uh, we didn't see the fisheries sector, you know, being touched in a significant manner. Uh, was this sector overlooked or Maybe we haven't seen everything yet. Uh, Brian, I, we can't argue that way. I think that, um, that I've just told you that yesterday we signed a, 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 a participation agreement between the counties along the Kenya coast and this ministry, this state department, for a 10 billion Kenya shillings program so you see, you can't put stimulus money where there is already money. You, you see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, 
And do you also know, Brian, that um, I think we have talked with you before. Last year in April, we launched uh, an aquaculture program, a program to, to farm fish, uh, commercialized fish farming in 15 counties in this country, a 15 billion Kenya shillings program. Uh, cooperation between the Kenyan government and IFAD. So as you can see, in the fishery sector, mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, enough package to, 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 to grow this sector. I think, I think we, 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 we're doing the right things moving forward, and that's not all. Mm -hmm. There are other government programs apart from this uh, that are already going on. So for example, we are dealing with a lot of uh, coastal infrastructure. You know, the landing sites, the f uh, fishing port facilities, we are doing this along the Kenya coast. We also uh, are construct uh, constructing fishing port facilities in the Lake Victoria fishery and things like that. So apart from these uh, 10 billion and 15 billion, mm -hmm. we have other uh, government activities going on or to grow the fishery sector. And I think it is important that we concentrate on the, the, fishing, the fishing port and, uh, and uh, fish landing facilities, because that is where the fishermen and the water meet. And this is important. Mm -hmm. And I think if we develop the fishing port and, uh, and uh, fish landing sites, then I think this is an development process that is going to open up our coastal areas in the sense that uh, these facilities will be connected with other infrastructure like roads, mm -hmm. like water, like electricity. And I think if we have done this systematically mm -hmm. over the years since independence, mm -hmm. our coastal areas will be some of the most developed areas like the rest of the world. If you look at the rest of the world, is that the major populations of people are along the coastal areas. But this is not true in the African context. You tend to find uh, lower populations in the coastal areas precisely because we never developed the infrastructure along these uh, areas. And some of those very important infrastructures are the fishing infrastructure because that is the meeting point between people and water. And in any case also, this infrastructure also become part of the, the security mechanism for a coastline, a coastline which is porous in most of the places. And uh, so for example, if you are the Kenya coast, our, our boundary is about 400 kilometers away. The, in, uh, at, the, at the edge of the exclusive economic zone in the waters. So you see, coastal infrastructure are very important to connect land activities and water economic activities overall. And I think we need to concentrate on this moving forward. Mm -hmm. That is my view. Mm -hmm. And it's also the same with um, other uh, uh, inland lakes, like when we talk about Naivasha, when we talk about Mbalingo and Nakuru. And there's always the connection between people and water. When you talk about Iriki Trukana, as it's a tourist, it's a people's places. People have certain affinity with water. The, so, so you're talking about, you know, 15 billion shillings, you know, from IFAD, uh, 10 billion shillings from the World Bank. Uh, you know, so in total, you're talking about, you know, 25 billion shillings, not of course, uh, forgetting, you know, the exchequer uh, 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 funding to us, the, the, these agriculture. And so it's proper to say that, uh, you know, the industry has not been left out. So uh, the other challenge would be, uh, you know, the floods. I mean, when you look at, you know, the almost 350 landing sites uh, uh, in the country, most of them are now submerged. Uh, you know, you know, Brian, is that um, way back in the 1990s, uh, the world started talking about climate change. 
and the people are postulating and asking this climate change, uh, how will it look like? Does it mean that it will be very hot here? Does it mean that uh, you see all these sorts of things? And uh, those days we used to say, oh, uh, when uh, the climate changes, the temperatures would rise, what would happen when temperatures rise and things like that? They say there will be thermal expansion and the surfaces of oceans would rise, so there will be sea level rise and things like that. But what we didn't know is that it was going to cause further changes, like changes in land for patterns, changes in the amounts of land, water that comes with this and so on and so forth. So what we've seen uh, since that time and now is the impacts have come in all sorts of ways, so much so that rains don't come at the time we expect them. Sometimes too much of it comes when we are not expecting that much and things like that. And uh, it's not just flooding in, um, in lakes and so on. It has caused a lot of havoc everywhere along river valleys, in places, in towns, and so on and so forth, Des and destroying infrastructure. And, and so all this is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, suffering for people. Landslides you've seen. For example, you are being told in Nairobi, remember the water systems, although the dams are, are, are full, the, the piping network has been affected by all this too much rain everywhere and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You saw what happened in the in the Lift Valley where the landslides, you know, killed the people and destroyed property and things like that. But for fisheries, what has happened is that uh, one, the aquaculture infrastructure where you have ponds, if they are flooded, everything goes. Therefore, you lose the entire crop. But uh, also to think that uh, in Lake Victoria, uh, most of the landing sites. And remember, we've been spending a lot of money on this. Are all flooded now, which means fishermen cannot land uh, fish in this uh, infrastructure. Uh, the buyers of fish cannot come to. They have, so we have no place to manage a fishery. That's why I talked about coastal infrastructure. And uh, when you think about our lakes, is that, uh, say, for example, Lake Victoria. It has got only one outlet at Njinja. So when there is a lot of rainfall, when there is a lot of runoff from the catchment, then there's bound to be a lot of flooding everywhere. And I think the same with the other lakes. We do not have outlets uh, out of this lake. So there's bound to be flooding. So I think what we need to think as government is to discuss flooding as a problem and get to think how to deal with it. And for example, for us in fisheries, do we need to relocate these landing sites so that we move them to safer places and probably plan better mechanisms to get into the lake and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Lakes also recede, you know, the levels would come down. Can we mark the highest levels? so that then we don't have people in flood prone areas. I think this is a discussion that we need to, to, to hold as a country. Mm -hmm. Liver valleys, we always told, don't farm, don't have activities so many meters away from the liver. I think we need to get back and, 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 and deal with these things because uh, we, 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 it, it's not good to see it three years ago, uh, two years ago, one year ago. This year we are seeing it. And we so can we guarantee that even five years so down we the line expect we next year mm -hmm. it's also going to be the same story and the same. So I think this is a challenge and people must understand this so that we keep away from flood prone areas. And, 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 and this industry, I mean, when you look at it, it is, it is facing also two major existential threats that, that are, not, they are, they are not only, you know, uh, are unique to, 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 to Kenya, but they are, they are, they are, 
they are the same, you know, globally. One of them, of course, you have enumerated, is the issue of uh, climate change. And the other one is, you know, pollution, especially, yeah. uh, 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 you know, the oceans and the lakes. Mm. How, how will we deal with this going forward? Well, the trouble with uh, all water ecosystems, whether lakes, uh, oceans, and uh, is that, uh, you know, geographically, mm -hmm. The waters are always in the lower part, uh, you know, physiographically. And so whatever we do, all human activities that occur around the waters and the wastes they produce, if not managed properly, mm -hmm. eventually it ends up in the lowest part of the globe, mostly the waters in the lakes. In the, in, the, in the oceans, through the rivers. The other day we were talking about, this time we are wearing masks and so on and so forth. Already the world has started seeing that uh, these masks that we are wearing to protect ourselves from COVID, mm -hmm. if not properly disposed, then they end up in the aquatic ecosystems. I was already seeing uh, clips on the TV last night, how these are impacting Water bodies, they are already there. Mm -hmm. uh, fish will start eating this material to clog their biological system, their in in intestine systems. Remember also we know about plastics in, 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 in our waters and mm -hmm. things like that. So I think we need an entire package of how to manage and treat wastes, whether domestic, industrial or urban so that it doesn't find its way into the, into the aquatic, into the water ecosystems. Thank you so much for joining us and, of course, enumerating some of the measures that the government is pulling in place to ensure yeah. there is exponential growth yeah. of this critical sector. Well, thank you very Asante much. Asante Sana for your time. Japet, Professor Ntiba is the principal secretary in charge of fisheries, aquaculture and blue economy. Joining us on Inside Government today to discuss and to, un to outline various measures that the government is putting in place to help the growth of this important sector and you have heard it from him and the challenge to you and me is we must and we have to support this industry by consuming more fish as much as possible we must move our per capita fish consumption from uh, below five past four, five, five kilograms per person to about 10 kilograms, you know, in the next five years. And I think this is something that is absolutely achievable. My name is O'Brien Kimani. Enjoy your fish. Good night. Mm -hmm.